put our six our sixth um, lecture with uh, Dr. Susan Nuski. Hello. Um, welcome everybody, Fungi Map members and visitors from across Australia and overseas. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians throughout this land and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We also recognise the deep cultural and scientific knowledge of um, Australian fungi held for millennia by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and we welcome you here today. I'm Susie Webster and I thank you all for joining us. At any time during this, this event, please feel free to submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your window. Um, and our hosts, myself or Roz, but Roz will be doing the questions today, uh, our Fungi Map president, and she will raise these with Susan at an interval and again at the end of this lecture. This brings us to our speaker and topic for today. Dr. Susan Nuski, I had the pleasure of meeting her in Cairns while she was doing her PhD at James Cook University. It was back in about 2016, it was a very long time ago. Um, and Susan specifically studied <clears throat> the endangered Northern Betong and the unique role in dispersing a high abundance and diversity of native truffles or hypergeous fungi. Um, before that, she did her honours and bachelor at the University of Queensland, um, Susan, where Susan majored in ecology and zoology. But um, it wasn't until her PhD in North Queensland where she discovered the fascinating world of fungi. Since then, Susan has been working as a postdoctoral researcher with the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Umeå, Sweden. Umeå, yeah. You'll need to correct that. Mm -hmm. um, where, we, where she investigated how fungi in the soil and in needle and needles interact with lodgepole pine invasions. Um, she's also done some lecturing at Uppsala University um, for a truffle course. And I have personally seen Susan's dedication to hunting truffles and mycorrhizal fungi, and trust me, it takes dedication. <laughs> So to quote Susan, the word truffle means different things to different people. While I am a fan of the chocolate variety, me too, um, I also love the many different fungal truffles from all over the world. For this lecture, uh, she's going to go through truffles and how they derive from mushroom or above ground ancestors, truffle diversity and some common families. Um, she'll also talk a bit about her PhD, which will be very exciting. So over to you, Susan. Okay, thank you, Susie. And thank you, Fungi Map, for um, inviting me for this lecture. And like Susie said, I'm going to talk about truffle diversity and mammal interaction. And I hope by the end of this, you will have an appreciation of just how amazing and diverse these organisms are. So this lecture it is an adaptation to a lecture that I give to Uppsala University. Um, and this uh, is part of a course that looks at the commercial truffles. And it's held on this island called Gotland in the Baltic Sea. And it's a beautiful island if you ever get to go there you know, post COVID times. But um, yeah, this island is one of the only places in Sweden where they cultivate the uh, what's native to there, the, the culinary truffle. So they use um, oak orchards, really old orchards, and they cultivate this very yummy truffle. And to find them, they train dogs to get them. So this is probably a very familiar thing to you. If, You've heard of truffles. It's probably what you think of is this really delicious, really expensive um, truffle that's sold around the world. But truffle means uh, much more than that. And I'll we'll go through what that is. So what is a truffle? Go through some scientific terms, which can be confusing, but hopefully I'll get um, 
for more clarity on that for you. Some major chakra groups, including some common ones in Australia and elsewhere. And I'll go through um, what was my PhD topic, why are endangered mammals important for truffle diversity? So uh, they're really quite central to Australian forests. Um, it's an important food source, but also to um, many endangered mammals around Australia. So when you see um, this slide, this is when we'll have the interval and I'll move on to my PhD topic. So firstly, what is a truffle? Well, uh, there are many terms in the scientific literature that refer to truffle or truffle-like organisms, and they can be quite similar, so it's a bit confusing. So gastioid versus gastroid, sequestrate and secretoid, hypogeus, epigeus. I mean, what, all, what do these all mean and how does that refer to truffle? Well, one of the classic definitions um, and is a bit more all-encompassing when you... Um, think about truffle or truffle-like organisms is the term sequestrate. So it describes fungal fruit bodies that have evolved from exposed hymenia and forcibly discharged store spores to a closed or hypogeous habit in which the spores are retained in the fruit body until it decays or is eaten by an animal vector. And they give a, a, um, a common example or a well-known example where the truffle Genus Rhizopogon has um, derived from Sewillus or Wallatesi common ancestors. So, uh, what this means is that, well, what I want you to understand is that truffles have evolved multiple times. So, um, it's not just one group, it's many, many different groups. It describes a type of fruiting body. And I've given a list here of different taxa that they're involved in. They're involved in four different phylum, so it's very, very diverse. Um, and there's thousands of species worldwide. So they can come in many different colors and textures and smells, um, and they're really quite amazing. So in general terms, if a truffle has evolved from a mushroom-like ancestor, it's, it kind of goes along this tra trajectory, or this is the most common, uh, commonly thought trajectory. And here you can see some of the terms that I mentioned before. So sequestrate refers to any organism that hasn't, is not quite a mushroom anymore, um, but has lost some of these characteristics that allow it to be pushed up out of the ground and the spores do be dispersed in the air. Um, and the characteristics that they most lose is um, the hymenium, so where the spores are produced becomes infolded and enclosed, so it becomes a bit more like a ball shape. The stipe becomes lost or remnant, and as you know, that's important for pushing out of the ground. And in secondoid um, truffle-like things, um, they mostly retain the stipe. Um, and they can be a little bit pushing out of the ground, so um, kind of semi hypogeous a little bit epigeous, um, but they mostly become this enfolded, enclosed ball shape. So that's a secretoid one. It's kind of halfway between what we would consider a, a um, more like more kind of potato truffle form and gastioid uh, refers to taxa that. Uh, are mostly hypogeous, below the ground, they don't ever emerge from the ground, they're completely enclosed, they've mostly lost the, the, the stipe or completely lost it, and they've lost this ability to be able to forcibly discharge the spores, and I'll explain what that means in a second, but hopefully that kind of clarifies some of these terms for you. And there was a fourth one that I mentioned that might be confusing when you come across some um, scientific literature about this is gastroid. And this is what I would consider sequestrate. So they've kind of uh, become enfolded and more ball shaped, but they're not technically truffles. And that's because they um, sometimes have 
retain this ability to be able to forcibly discharge their spores or they just have a, a powdery spore mass on the end so they can just release them to the air. Um, and these are things like, like puffballs or earth stars and um, the images on the left are the kind of epigeus relatives and on the right there are other gastroid relatives. Um, yeah, so they're not quite truffles, but they have some truffle-like characteristics. And the term gastioid definitely refers to truffles and sometimes secatoid. So when you look in just Basidia micota, um, that phylum in there, um, the spores are obviously derived on, in, on the hyphae called the Basidia. Um, and there's some of the terms that refer to the different parts of the truffle are slightly different to what you would um, call for mushrooms. So the stipe is we'll called the stipe, but the inside or the hymenium is referred to the gleba, and the outside bit or the cap on a mushroom is referred to as the peridium. And in non truffle things, so this is what um, um, I was going to explain further with the uh, forcibly discharging of the spores in non trouble things like mushrooms. They have this really cool mechanism where they use um, different uh, surface tensions of, of liquids uh, that form just on where the, the spore is attached to the basidia. And this, this different surface tensions um, mean that once the spore is mature, it actually just springs off like it has some kind of force behind it. And so that's what it means it forcibly discharges the spores to be able to release them to the air. But truffles have lost this feature because they don't need it. They're in underneath the soil. Um, and what's really neat is that if you have a truffle specimen and you do a slide underneath the microscope to look at the spores, quite often you'll see truffle spores still attached to the basidia, which is quite cool. In Ascomycota, uh, a different phylum, this um, uh, commonly, the, the the um, morphology of Ascomycota is commonly a cup-like fungi or disc-like fungi. Um, that's the ant Epigeus ancestors, but that has become kind of a cup-like thing and become enfolded and enclosed to become a truffle. Um, in, in the cups, the, the spores are formed within ASCII and within the hyphae, and they're kind of like these long, thin, cannon-like shapes, so like the spores can be shot up outside um, of the spore to be able to forcibly discharge, but because the truffles don't need that mechanism anymore, they don't actually need this, this long, thin hyphae um, because they don't need that mechanism, so there's a lot more freedom in the morphology of the ASCII for truffles, so they have um, more ball shaped or more like teardrop shaped um, ASCII. But there's always exceptions to the rule in biology, which I think is uh, quite amusing sometimes. And this, this genus uh, Geopora and this uh, species here, Geopora cuperi, have, for whatever reason, they're truffles. They exist below the ground, almost near below the ground. And they still have this mechanism to be able to forcibly discharge the spores. And it, it's, um, there's this famous quote about it that I think brings about some rather amusing um, imagery. So when an animal bites into the truffle to be able to eat it, they would get like a cloud of uh, spores in their face, <laughs> which probably is a bit of a surprise for the animal. <laughs> So next I'll go through some major truffle groups um, and I'll go through um, Ascomycota first. So within Ascomycota in the Uratales order, there are, um, there's one, 
family and another uh, genus, which we don't know which family it belongs to, that are truffles. And the most common one is Elaphomytaceae, which have the Elaphomyces truffles or the deer truffles. I think they're called deer truffles because in other parts of the world, deers eat them. We have them in Australia, they're quite common as well. Um, and the epigeus relative for this group is this funny looking uh, fungus in the top right here that called pseudotelostoma. So it has like a, a little cup that it erupts from with the stalk and the spores are up there. And that's what the epigeus relative looks like for this group. Um, all Elaphomyces are ectomycorrhizal, so they have association with plants. They kind of have this thick, tough, uh, like peridium, uh, often kind of brown or black hyphae with some brightly colored hyphae intermixed with that. And they have a powdery spore mass on maturity. And they also have really cool looking spores. So this paper has fantastic photography, if you ever get a chance to look it up. Um, these uh, circles here are all different uh, spores from all different species within this group. And they look like little planets. So they're just fascinating. They have all these different ornaments on the outside, different colors, slightly different sizes. Um, so there's quite a little diversity just within this group or within species within this group. And we have um, many Australian um, Elaphomyces, including one that's uh, named after Queensland, where I'm from, Queensland Nicus, with uh, quite fascinating ornamentation on the spores as well. So there's another um, um, truffle within the um, Elaphomytaceae or Elaphid tails, this, um, this order is Diliomyces microsporus. So this truffle is actually considered a weed. So the agaricus button mushroom, um, when they uh, cultivate it on a large scale, it actually can get in and live amongst it and produce these truffles. And when it produces the truffles, it means that the button mushrooms produce less mushrooms. So it's a weed within that context. People don't want it there. And it's actually never been recorded in the wild. It's only known from this context. And because uh, there's been a lot of effective management to reduce the amount of this truffle in that context, it's been proposed um, for the IUCN um, to uh, have it as a red list, um, as a, a threatened taxa, um, even though it's a weed. So I find that kind of fascinating um, paradox. <laughs> so another group within Ascomycota is the Ezizales. Um, and within this order, there are at least 10 families where truffles occur. So one family within this order is the tuberaceae. And this contains this famous um, tuba species that are cultivated and very, very yummy. Um, and while there's probably about half a dozen species within tuba that are cultivated for their taste around the world, there's actually 180 species that occur naturally. So it's quite a diverse uh, genus. The Epidius relative for the Northern Hemisphere taxa um, is this kind of cup of fungus here. Um, but the Southern Hemisphere, which actually has distinct um, taxa, they've done the phylogenetics and they're, they're quite uh, separate. Um, the Epigeus relative is this Underwoodia uh, genus, so like a, like a finger-like fungus. Um, so the Southern Hemisphere, we have genus like the uh, Labyrinthomyces, the Dinglia, and the Rediliomyces. And this um, Dinglia or Labyrinthomyces um, is quite common. It's um, 
I've I've picked it up from the from the ground many times, and it has like this funny nutty smell to it. It's really quite fascinating. Another family within um, this group is the Bezizaceae. So these are the epigeus ones that have that form cups or discs. Um, but the truffles in this group are desert truffles. So within Africa, in Australia, they form these rather big truffles. And it's fascinating because the indigenous peoples in Africa and the Aboriginals in Australia have this um, local knowledge to be able to find and prepare these truffles to be able to eat them. So they're quite important for local culture. And the morphology within the Pezizaceae of the truffles can vary quite a bit. So they can be all enfolded and kind of look like brains or they can just look like potatoes or they have this funny structure where they actually don't have a peridium and the uh, ascii are on the outside, but they're truffles because they're kind of ball shaped and they are hypogeous. So again, biology always has exceptions. So that was some common groups within the Asco mycota. Within the Pisidio mycota, um, they're are lots of relatives and some for families or uh, mushrooms, which you might be more familiar with. So within the agaricales, there are at least 13 families that have truffles in them. Agaricase is a very common mushroom. Of course, they're the button mushrooms, but the truffle relatives or the truffle-like relatives um, look like this. So they can be the secatoid ones where they retain a lot of the characters of the mushroom ancestor. They still have a stipe. They might be um, epigeous or semi-hypogeous, but the hymenium has become enfolded and no longer completely exposed. Um, and so they kind of look like a mutated mushroom. Uh, within this group, they can also have more uh, kind of potato looking uh, truffles. And um, what's interesting is that they're found in arid zones, typically within Australia, America, Central Asia and Europe. So um, these um, are mostly not mycorrhizal like the mushrooms. So they tend to be saprotrophic or, in, or have other lifestyles. And the truffle ones that kind of look like my, uh, potatoes are hard to place purely on their morphology. They often need um, molecular data to be able to say, okay, they're in the Agaricaceae group. Another common group uh, that contains truffles is the Cortinariaceae. So Cortinarius is um, very common mushroom. And within this group, um, truffles have evolved multiple times. And so the names have become rather confused throughout history. And um, they've done the phylogenetics on this group and discovered that the, some of the, um, the taxa most closely align with some of the uh, mushroom ancestors. So they've renamed um, what used to be Daxonogaster or Protogossum or Hymenogaster. Um, these names used to refer to the truffle relatives in Cortinariaceae, but they've renamed them to say Cortinarius could refer to a truffle or a mushroom in this group. Makes it kind of confusing if you're just looking at uh, names on a screen, but uh, makes sense when it comes to the phylogenetics. So Cortinarius is a very common mushroom. It's very diverse throughout the world. Um, and if you have a very good specimen um, of a, a Cortinarius truffle, and if you look very closely at the kind of base of the truffle, you can see the Cortina. So the Cortina is like this spiderweb-like um, hyphae that is very visible on, on the mushroom uh, taxa. 
but they can have a cortina um, on very good, well-preserved specimens um, of the truffles as well. So this is some of examples of the cortinarius. This is um, these cortinarius uh, truffles or truffle-like taxa were all described by a PhD student, Melissa Danks, in the north, um, northern New South Wales from just one region. And there's, so there's a huge diversity that we just haven't described yet. And they have very similar hues to the mushrooms, like this rusty brown with all the, the kind of purpley colours. So the next group that I'm going to introduce you to is the boiler tails. So there's at least 10 families that have truffles within them. And they can be really quite brightly coloured, just like the um, Volatesi mushrooms. So these are the, the pored mushrooms um, found again throughout the world. Um, interestingly, many of the new uh, genera of the truffles within this group are described in Africa. Um, and they're so brightly coloured that this Soliocassis uh, mushroom is nicknamed the sunset uh, truffle. And so Jim Trappy and team described this truffle and it's really quite brightly orange and red. And they named it the sunset truffle because apparently it, it reminded them of uh, Australian sunsets, which is quite nice. It's so found within Southeast Queensland and, and North Queensland. So again, these very uh, uh, verse colours for this group. So the pinks and yellows and blues, uh, really quite pretty little truffles. Um, and also really fascinating ones. So there's um, this species, Gymnocaster by the tweets. Actually, it doesn't have a very formed peridium. So what you're seeing here, this little kind of sponginess, is the exposed gleba of the truffle. They tend to be um, epigeous or semi-hypogeous, this species, found in uh, southeast Queensland and other places. Um, so like some of the, the um, uh, mushroom ancestors, they bruise and they change colour when you when you touch them. So they're, they're quite interesting species. And another one which I find quite amusing is this truffle um, called spongy form of square pansii. So obviously mycologists have a sense of humour. <laughs> um, so this interesting grain looking truffle again doesn't have a a peridium that's formed. So you're just looking at the exposed glebe or hymenium. Uh, I think it was discovered in Southeast Asia somewhere. And when they found it, they didn't know what group it belonged with. Um, so they had to do the phylogenetics to find out it was in the Volataceae. So rather interesting. So the next group I'm going to talk about is the Hysterangiales. Um, and it contains one of my favourite truffles, um, the mesophilia. So the hysterangiales is an ancient group. They're all truffles and we do not know of any epigeous relatives um, within this group. But related groups to this order, like the gomphorels or the phalliales, um, are like the trumpet um, like fungi or the coral fungi or the phallus-like fungi. So just to give you an idea where they kind of are placed in the phylogenetic tree. Hysterangiaceae is a, a family within this group. They, um, as in Teresa LaBelle and other colleagues are currently working on this group. So I think there's going to be some reshuffling of names and, and whatever in the, not too distant future, but it's a very common group around, found throughout uh, the world and in Australia it's one of the most common uh, truffles that I would find when I'm looking for truffles. 
Uh, the, again, the Northern and Southern Hemisphere um, lineages are quite distinct and they can have really interesting textures. So they're kind of like this gelatinous texture. So if you imagine like a rubber ball or a Turkish delight with the, uh, the candy, somewhere in between that texture is, is like what they feel like. They're quite kind of spongy. And they have really interesting spores where um, they have what's called a, a utricle or a, a kind of membrane around their spores. Another um, group within this is the Mesophiliaceae. There's at least eight genera. All of them are uh, ectomycorrhizal with eucalyptus and other uh, Australian taxa, but they're an Australian or Australasian endemic, so they are local truffles. Um, and they're very common. They're very common in Australian diets, and they have a very interesting multimodal dispersal, which I'll go into in just a second. But they have really cool characteristics as well. Gummy globus, one genus within this um, group, has amazing texture. It's literally gummy. It's like chewing gum. You pull it up out of the ground and you pull up a huge clump of soil with it because the hyphae of this group is sticky. It like it gathers all the soil around it and you pull it apart and it's like stretchy. It's amazing, it has a wonderful property, and I have no idea how how it does it, like what kind of compounds are in there too to um, make it have this characteristic, but it's, it's fascinating. So mesophilia, I have to say, is my favorite truffle, somewhat because it, uh, it's one of the first truffles that I ever found when I was doing my PhD, so I learned all about it. Um, but it actually has this rather cool multimodal dispersal. So in the middle of the truffle, they have this uh, sterile core that kind of acts as a food reward for the animals because the outside of this truffle is kind of crusty and and brittle not very appealing to be able to you know not very tasty the spores become powdery very quickly not very tasty again so the only thing that the animals would be eating if they eat this truffle is this core core and it doesn't produce any spores. So being able to grow this uh, core is energetically expensive for the truffle, but um, a reward for the animals. Um, and so the, when the animal digs up this truffle, breaks it open and eats the, the core, it exposes this powdery spore mass so it obviously eats some of the spores. The spores get all over its snout or nose or whatever it is, all over its pores, all over the soil surface, and then puffs into the air. So there's many different ways in which the spores are spreading just by one animal coming and digging it out of the ground, which I think is really fascinating. And they also have a really interesting smell and they change smell uh, after fire. So um, they're kind of a nutty smell and they can change to like an oniony smell if uh, a patch of forest is burnt and it makes it really easy for the animals to come and find this truffle. Okay, so another group um, is the Rachelales, which again is a very common um, mushroom family, but there's lots of truffles. Um, and at least three families. So at least th seven genera have truffles within them, um, including the Russia and Lactarius, very common mushrooms. Um, they're ectomycorrhizal. They tend to be fleshy like, like the mushrooms and have common characteristics like the Lactarius um, truffle produces milk like the, like the mushrooms. And they have really cool spores. So the ornamentation on the spores is um, often very intricate and very like, involved. <laughs> and um, this group, like the mushrooms, have um, uh, all have an amyloid reaction. So when you put uh, iodine chemicals on the spores, they change colour to a blue-black. 
<clears throat> okay, now I'm going to move quickly on to the last two groups, the last two phylum that contain truffles. One is the zygomycota, and mostly within this, this uh, genus called uh, endogony or endogony. I've heard people say it different, different ways. And this truffle is actually really small. It tends to be, oh, no, I've got it the wrong way around. These truffles can be quite big, small, but like sizable. And their spores are quite sizable as well. So Ascomycota, the Cydia mycota, has small spores, around about 20 microns. These can have spores over 100 microns. So um, sometimes visible with the naked eye, they're quite, they're quite large. And the other group that I'm going to mention is uh, Glomulomycota. These are all the Asco, I mean, Abascular, sorry. A buscular mycorrhizae, uh, so they associate with many different plants, very important for um, plant biodiversity functioning, whatever. Um, genuses like Gigospora and Glomulus are very common. Um, and these are the truffles that are really tiny. Um, you know, only a few mil at most, or you know, a centimeter or something, but the spores can be really huge like over 60 microns. Okay, so that's um, the huge diversity of truffles that I've gone through. And we'll take a, a short break for questions, if you have any. Thank you. Hello, this is Roz Hart. Um, I'm the president at Fungi Map, so I'm interested to take, take any questions. So far on our Q&A, we haven't got any questions, Susan. I think everybody's so be, been so busy writing it all down. And for me, I'm going, oh, so this is how this relates to this. And that's why that's happened, because I've only met a few parts of this. So Susan, I'm finding this very interesting. And here we have a question. So Susan, the question is, how do truffles and their epigeus relatives occur in nature? Can they be found at the same location or not? Yeah, absolutely, the same location, even within meters from each other. Um, so one of the theories about why, how, like one of the drivers of evolution for truffles is because they're trying to conserve water. And that might be true in some locations, but because they co can co-occur in the same location, it's not the only driving factor for why truffles have evolved. So yeah. And one is, how do you find truffles? Well, I know, but Susan, you can explain it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, you know, in truffle orchards, they use dogs, obviously, but to find naturally occurring truffles, you have to rake. So you use a rake and you look underneath the, the um, litter layer, even within the soil. Um, and what's commonly used in, in scientific methods is to be able to time yourself. You map out an area and you time how uh, long it takes to rake per area. And then, you know, how many truffles you find is how many um, kind of raking hours you do. But um, yeah, I'll just remind the general public that collection and in most locations requires a permit. <laughs> but in your backyard, if you've got native trees and, and whatever, you might be able to find troubles. You can rake around the base of the tree and, and find some. Hmm. Great. So Vanessa Ryan asks you, do you know if Jim Trappy has identified the glummy, gum, try again, gummy globa that we found at Davis Creek during the Cairns workshop a few years ago? Oh yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the um, the uh, the gummy globus is one of the ones with a very fascinating uh, chewing gum like texture that we we're always talking about before. Yeah, it's good that he's identified it. Mm. Oh, that's great. Now, another question: Do truffles ever go back to being mushrooms again? Are the drivers that have truffles emerge above ground again? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't know of any examples. Uh, of that, but you know, nature could surprise you. Um, hmm. Then we have another question. Do these truffles have any known pharmaceutical qualities? 
Oh, I'm sure they could be. I don't know of any examples. Um, that's not really my field. I'm sorry. Someone else might be able to answer that before me. Travel us long enough to have done any work on that, have we? Yeah, I, the, I've only known a few, like a handful of studies that looked at the chemicals that make the smell of truffles and why animals are attracted to them. But in terms of pharmaceuticals, you know, there's so many different compounds that we've yet to discover. And the fungi world is a really great resource for that. And they've done this with many other types of um, fungi. So I'm sure that there could be a possibility there, but I think yeah, I don't know of any examples, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, we're still busy discovering the truffles themselves, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So we have another question about when raking, how deep do you need to go? Like 10, 20 centimetres? What? Yeah, um, some examples, like even the mesophilia, can be up to 30 centimetres below the surface. But generally, it's within the 10, 20 centimetres. Um, you would find some. And it sounds, sounds silly, but sometimes you can use your own nose. When, when I had my PhD supervisor say this, I thought she was crazy. But when you're raking and you smell something, you smell something interesting or just not quite soil smell, but like different, you're like, oh, I'm onto something. <laughs> that is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And when you think like, you know, if you have a dog, you notice how dogs' noses are so much more sensitive than ours. Mm. And I presume our marsupials' noses are much more sensitive to ours. So if we can smell it, just think what it's like to them. Yeah, exactly. It must be very, very strong. Very enticing. That's mm -hmm. right. I've um, actually come across truffles that smell like um, jackfruit. Right. And, yeah. So some hysterangians smell like jackfruit. Um, right. And I've been in the field with someone and we've walked past these, this section and we're like, we smell it. And we dug around and we found it. It was amazing. Like it was that so strong. That was so rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Now we have another question about how long do truffles last? Now, how would we know this? It says, are they only for a short time like fungi fruiting bodies? Mm. Well, what do you think? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I don't think we know for many of the taxa. So some of the fleshy ones, so like the um, rushula relatives, they often, when you find them, they often have um, um, larvae and, and other insects already eating it. So those types of ones maybe not last very long in the soil, mm -hmm. but there's other taxa like the the mesophilia that have a kind of a hard crust on the outside, they often incorporate soil into the, the peridium, might last a, a lot longer. So it's, yeah, I, I don't know of any good studies that have really found this out, but, you know, they might not. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. Then we have another question about, do you have any idea why fire impacts the smell of the mesophilia species? No, that's another good question. I don't think we've we've done that study yet. Um, yeah, yeah. But well, it must that is observation, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a very common observation about this taxa, um, and it must just change some chemistry within the mushroom. Maybe it's like a signal that the the, the fungus starts changing the chemistry around the olfactory things. Like yeah, it's just. And once there's a fire, of course, then there'll be seedlings coming up so that the, the fungi spores will be wanting to, to mate up with the, um, the seedlings. So yeah. maybe there's a more urgency there or something like that. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a part of the whole cycle. Right. Okay. Well, you've done very well with those questions and quite a lot of very interesting ideas in those questions. So yes. yeah, there you go. So, oh, no, I think there's another question. Yes. Okay. Well, I think, is there a list of the truffles and their associated plants and trees for Australia? Um, it says the critters seem to find the first on our place, it seems. So. Oh, yeah, we wish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there, unfortunately, is no, no like, um, 
field guide or anything that's been put together by uh, people that study truffles. The literature is very scattered. Um, so while there, there might be some random websites or something that you can um, refer you to, there is, yeah, the Australian mycology just hasn't quite got there in terms well, of- like you say, Slow down people, we're still finding this out. So this is actually happening right now. Yeah, really exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So um, there's some really good papers with lists, um, but they're often referred to, um, you know, the very specific location where they've done that study. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So in Australia, like 40 years ago, people were being told there was no truffles in Australia. Now, on, you know, they were thinking of, you know, European truffles and things like that, but they, they were just saying we didn't have truffles at all. So that's only, you know, in living memory. Which is yeah. amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And there's a question of your slide down the bottom left that says in the bush saying, where would you start to look for truffles? Oh, anywhere there's um, native. So most truffles that we know of are ectomycorrhizal. Uh, and I'll actually go into what that means more fully in this next part. But it means that um, most native trees and native shrubs um, would have this um, in their in the forest, not so much in rainforest, um, less so in in heat and other things like proteaceae is one uh, group that doesn't associate with these fungi. So anywhere there's lots of that in there that as a dominant overstory, maybe not. But eucalyptus forest, casuarina forest, melaleuca, that kind of forest would have definitely have troubles. And even in urban settings where there's random eucalyptus trees would probably have some tax around it. Yeah, that's a good point. I also find that if you see somewhere that obviously for us in this case in Western Australia, the, where the quenders have been digging, that's an interesting place to, to start. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good good point. If you see um, native animal digging, that's, that's a very good, uh, good sign that there's troubles around. Yeah. Well, thank you for your answers to those questions. I think we're ready to, to go back to, to your talk. Okay, thank you. I hope I don't run too much over time or go through this very quickly. <laughs> well, you can tell there's a lot of interest. So, so don't, don't, you know, it doesn't matter if you go a bit over time. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rose. Okay, so for this next part, I'll go through some results of my PhD. Uh, so, as I mentioned, um, most troubles we know of are ectomycorrhizal. And what that means is that um, the fungi and plants have this symbiosis. The, the hyphae grow in and around um, the roots of the plant and they exchange uh, nutrients. So, the fungus gives the plants nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And the plant um, makes carbohydrates or sugars through photosynthesis and they give it to the plant. And the fungus can extend the root system into the cell quite a long way because they're much smaller in diameter and they actually can grow a lot further. So they're very important for plant health, nutrient cycling and plant diversity. And many mammals and many uh, native Australian mammals eat fungi, although not all equally. And I'll divide the, the mammals uh, into two groups. So one is fungal specialists, and these are potteroos and fechongs. So they're smaller relatives of kangaroos uh, within the same order, but not um, the same family. And these guys are specialized in eating truffles. Um, their gut system is adapted for it. They have very good noses for it. And 50 to 80 or 90% of their diet is truffles. So their ecology is very tightly connected with truffle diversity. Um, but many other mammals within Australia eat truffles like, you know, wallabies and paddy melons and native rodents, um, possums and, and bandicoots, um, many other mammals also eat them. But I'll refer to these ones as fungal generalists, and that's because while they eat fungi, and sometimes in really high uh, diversity and abundance, 
they don't rely on truffles for their survival. They can switch to other foods. Uh, so their ecology is less tightly interconnected with um, truffles and truffle diversity. So this relationship is all um, tightly connected with how the forest functions. The mammals um, eat truffles. They disperse the spores through their feces or scats. The truffles um, most of the time are ectomycorrhizal. So they're really tightly connected with uh, the plant diversity and plant community. And all of this means that it's, it's functioning in a way that allows the forest to be healthy um, and sustainable. But one unfortunate thing about Australian mammals is that we have the highest rate of mammal extinction and decline, and this includes the fungal specialists, this group that I talked about. So three species within this family are extinct, and two are critically endangered, one endangered, and the other are vulnerable and near threatened. So that means the, the range, the, the distribution, uh, the area in which these uh, species used to occur is nowhere near what they do now. They're only in remnant forest habitats um, where there's high um, diversity of truffles in which they occur and intact forest. So my question for my PhD was, how does that affect truffle diversity? And to be able to answer that requires a lot of um, study and steps along the way. And one of the things we can use to understand that is to study functional redundancy. So basically, can a diverse group of mammal generalists that occur in the remnant forest that are uh, that are disturbed, but um, you know, not too disturbed, <laughs> can they compensate for the loss of a fungal specialist? Can the same diversity of truffles uh, be dispersed by these? Um, these generalists where in areas where we've lost the, the specialists. So that um, led to one of the hypotheses for my thesis was betongs and potteroos, because they are specialists, contribute disproportionately more to the dispersal of fungi and truffles than other mammals. And I tested whether that was true um, by looking at the northern betong. So this is um, one of the specialists that occurs in northern Queensland near Cairns. One of the main uh, populations is in Lamb Range. So that's around um, the Atherton Tablelands near Bariba. Um, and um, they used to occur in more southern um, areas, say around the Conan range near Townsville. But unfortunately, other populations have become extinct. Uh, one good news is that in the Carbine ranges, we discovered what well, the, the team that I was part of during my PhD discovered um, a new population that we didn't know occurred. So there's now two populations that we know of, which is very good. But yes, I looked at Northern Betong to, to ask this question, how important are they for truffle dispersal? And how I did that was um, I trapped the animals um, and we collected the scats from the wild. And um, I used what's called high throughput sequencing. So basically I uh, looked at the DNA of the fungi in the, the scats to be able to see which fungi are being uh, dispersed and which are in the diet of all the different mammals that I was able to, to get scats for. I also looked at uh, tree roots and soil within the same community to look at the overall impact on the, the ecosystem. So I'll just quickly jump into some results that we have. Um, and when I I, I will refer to species in this instance as OTU, and it's just a technical term, operational taxonomic unit, um, that refers to what is can be considered a molecular species. Um, and what I did was uh, 
uh, looked at the fungal community that I sequenced from the different scats in three different groups. One was overall, so all the fungi, and this includes mushrooms, um, you know, yeast and, and other sapotrophic things that are going to be picked up when I sequence the overall fungal community in that group. The other group was ectomycorrhizal. Um, so these uh, taxa that we know associate with plants, but it also includes the mushroom taxa. And then I then further narrowed it down to just the truffles. Um, so when we look at all OTUs, the specialists for the, the um, Northern Beton um, has 88, 188, sorry, um, molecular species in their scats as opposed to 101 for the generalist. And this generalist line includes nine other mammal species. So I combined another, nine other mammal species and looked at the average number of um, molecular species in their, in their scats. So already at the overall community level, the Northern Beton eats on average more fungi. This is particularly true for the mycorrhizal taxa and the truffle taxa. So they eat a higher diversity than nine other mammals in the same location. Um, and you narrow that down to um, the unique taxa, again, in these three different categories. Um, within the ectomycorrhizal taxa, Northern Bettons eat 151 unique species as opposed to the nine other mammals eating only 56. So what's only in the um, Northern Beton diet is far exceeding what is dispersed by the other mammal species in the same location. And this is also true for the just the truffle. Uh, taxa. So 77 um, truffle taxa are only within Northern Bettons and not within the, um, the generalist species. So to be able to, to depict this uh, graphically, I made this, this graph and the boxes on the top um, or the rectangles on the top represent the different mammal species and the, the wide one in the middle is the Northern Breton. The ones down the bottom are the different truffle taxa and the lines between them are whether or not it is in um, the mammals scats or the mammal diets. And as you can see, the Northern Breton is connected to much more of the whole mammal Whole, sorry, whole truffle community than any individual um, uh, fun, any individual mammal species in the same community. Okay, I also looked at the roots of the plants in the same habitat, um, and I looked at the what was um, dominant in that community. So if you take the whole community, you look at the relative abundance of the reeds, so the relative abundance of the DNA strands that we get, um, and look at the dominant community. So that is um, makes up 90% of the all of the DNA strands that we get. Four, four genera come up as really important as within that dominant portion, three of them are truffles. So one is chondrogaster, hysterangium, and mesophilia. These three are the dominant on, this, on the trees within the same habitat. The other one is cotinarius, and that can include the mushrooms and the truffles. And unfortunately, we didn't have enough data resolution to be able to say, okay, there are only truffles. But um, what is really key here is that what's associating with the trees in the same habitat is truffles. So it means that the mammals dispersing the truffles 
are, are really important for the overall um, e ecosystem functioning. They're important for the ectomycorrhizal community, for the plant health, for the plant community. So in conclusion, um, I found that was pretty good evidence that the Northern Betong were dispersing uh, a higher, uh, a disproportionately more diversity and abundance of truffles than the other mammal community. This is obviously really important for truffle diversity and ectomycorrhizal community as a whole. Um, so yes, we need to conserve and, and think about these, these fungal specialists in order to conserve truffle diversity. Okay, thank you. That, that's my last slide. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, so much. I think everybody who is watching is really, really taken and interested in what you're talking about. And um, some of those truffles are, I know are really hard to find. Sometimes when you're out hunting for them, they're virtually on the surface and easy to find. And, and those are always interesting ones. They can be quite bright and or white, like the little ones behind me here. Mm -hmm. You see, I find them most of all. I can't yeah, remember sure. the name, <laughs> but yeah. But anyway, thank you so much. Um, um, for those of you who still have questions for Susan, um, are there more questions, Roz? No, the only comments saying very, very interesting, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Okay. If anybody does have more questions, please send them through to fungimapcoord at gmail.com and we will pass them on to Susan and get you some answers. Um, yeah. I do have and a question. May I ask one, please? Go. So how long do we think it's going to take before we're going to really see the effects of the extinction of these animals? Because my question is, I mean, sometimes these fungi will last, but we're not giving them the boost that they need from these animals. So... I mean, I think a lot of forests that are starting to look not their selves the way they used to look 40, 50 years ago, is this what's happening? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's a very good question, which again, I don't think I have a really good answer for. I think what we what we see in a lot of circumstances where we lose, you know, there might be a patch of forest, but around it is farmland or around it is is urban areas. And so you lose the mammals first, right? And the fungi are still there, but over time, because there's not uh, as much dispersal happening, you might start to lose some of the less common fungal species. Um, so what is that diversity loss happening? And, and how long does that take for you know, the loss of mammals to mean that the, the fungus is no longer there? We don't really know. There might be what they call an extinction debt so we, we yet to see the extinction, but it, we predict that it's going to happen because they don't have the dispersers anymore. We certainly know in, in urban situations or in, in other, you know, where there's just a fragmented trees or fragmented forest, troubles can occur there, but we don't know how healthy those populations are, whether they've um, they become inbred or whether they've uh, they're losing a lot of the um, genetic diversity that requires a long-term sustainable population. So yes, that's a very, it's a golden question. <laughs> so it also tells us that every little bit of remnant bush is valuable, very valuable. Yes, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to be able to connect them for the animals that, you know, might eat one, one remnant and it can go to another forest and move that genetic diversity around. That's right. And of course, our mammals don't fly. So, you know, so birds could move things around, but they don't eat truffles. So, right. Yeah, well, the, it, I think um, Todd Elliott, who I think is giving another talk this year, might uh, have something to say about that, which is a very interesting oh. research that's coming up. Yeah. That could be really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Well, I'll pass you over to Susie. Okay. Yeah. The, um... The sunset truffle was found this year at the BioBlitz up at um, Kalula region as well, which I don't think it's been found 
for about 10 years or something. So that, that was pretty exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'll hunt down the name. Did Jim give a name to, to Vanessa's Gummy Globus? Do you recall? Um, no, I, I don't remember that. Sorry. But yes. That's all right. I'll hunt, I'll hunt him down. I'm, we're communicating at the moment about a few things. So I'll give him a prod along and see if I can find out what that name is. If, it, if it's been done, I think it has, but I don't know. But anyway, thank you again, Susan. That was really interesting. And I was absolutely glued to the screen. Um, lots, of, lots of things in there that are um, very exciting and interesting. And there's lots of room for research. And I think someone suggested that maybe we need to put together a little brochure for truffles um, in yes. Australia or hypogeus fungi in Australia. So that's, that's probably a little project we can talk to you about. Yeah. <laughs> and a job for fungi map to support for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah it, they really it'd be good if there is some in fungi down under yeah. i see <laughs> yeah but um anyway sadly that brings us to the end of of our first this lecture and our first series of lectures um keep an eye out in october we're hoping to start again then um, Todd, I've, I'm talking to at the moment, but his season is all messed up. He can't get out to his, um, his sites because of the lock in New South Wales. So he's, he's a bit all over the place. If, if borders open, then he's gone and we might lose him, but, um, we're working on it. Um, so there will be some interesting lectures coming up. I'm talking to quite a few different people. So keep an eye out, especially around September. Hopefully we'll start announcing them. But um, any questions, as I said, please email um, sophie at fungimapcoord at gmail.com and we'll get the questions to Susan. Um, if you'd like to join Fungimap or purchase any books, uh, please go to the website, fungimap.org.au. And thanks again. Look forward to seeing you at the second start of the second series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.